you are listening to A Scary State, and this week we have another spooky special, and we're talking about New Year's crimes. So, Lauren? Yes, Kenzie? Let's get scary. <laughs> that was all improvisation. Oh my god, you are so talented. Thank you. We do have yet another special episode. Another one. Because what else are you going to do during the holidays? Yeah, and then, you know, it kind of prolongs the states, I feel like, too. Yeah. Exactly. You know, because it allows more shit to happen. <laughs> so then as we keep going, there's always stuff to talk about. <laughs> and sometimes it's fun to just do something else. Yes, that's true too. Because my case is not in the U.S. this time. Ooh. Mm-hmm, I know. Look at that. I know. It is nice to have the freedom to be able to do like anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> right. Where you can be like, hmm, yes. where is this going to take me and today? You're not confined to one specific spot. Exactly. So, which is why we tried, you know, Germany, Canada, Australia a little bit. Yeah, and that was great, but it's hard when the websites are in other languages. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and we realized that we can't do that. <laughs> right. So, because there will be like two in English, and you're like, hmm, hmm, that gives me two pages. I I added an extension to my Chrome that <laughs> uh, automatically translates websites that are in other languages. See, y'all were dedicated. Yeah, but not every website. Yeah. There are some websites you don't want to click into. Correct. So. Also, I have so much candy in that bowl if you want some. That sunflower bowl is literally filled to the top <laughs> with candy. Well, because for Christmas, everyone's like, here's some candy. Here's some more candy. And then I got people candy. And then I had leftover candy because people at work didn't take more candy. And now it's just a whole bowl of candy. Mm-hmm. <sighs> this is too much for me. <laughs> All right, Mackenzie, tell me about your Christmas. So I went to New Orleans, Ugh. like I usually do, because that's where my grandparents live and where my dad is from. So I feel like I am authentically a New Orleansian. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we arrived, we went to an escape room. Like, oh, instantly. Fun. Oh, my God. And we killed it. How much time did you have left? So, well, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's seven of us. So... Okay, we get into the second room, and first getting started, and I see a fishing rod. And I remember that in the other room, there was a little fishing outhouse. And I was like, "Mm, I bet, because I can take the fishing rod out. It's not, like, dead attached. Yeah. That it has to do something. Sure enough, I walked over, and the toilet is now lit up. And I'm like, aha, there's a key. And I got the other key. Oh, my goodness. Look at you. So smart. And... There was a part where you had to, like, take these – it was supposed to be tarot cards, but they weren't what we think of as tarot cards. Right. And you're supposed to line them up in this very specific order to, like, break this curse. It was actually – um, do you remember the witch? Her name was Julie something. She was a legend of a witch down in, like, the bayous of Louisiana. Okay. And – the townspeople didn't like her. They kicked her out. And oh, she cursed the area. Um, oh, uh-huh. Yeah. And, like, nothing could be built on it. There was all oh my these gosh. storms. You know who I'm talking about. Yes. Yes. That one. Yes. It was hers. <laughs> and so you had to lay the tarot cards out to, you know, help right the wrong. And thank fucking God that I did planned ahead because we had just run out of time. And thank God I already had the spot so we didn't have to think too hard. And the lady was an angel because we were so close. She was like, just finish. You're so close. The thing opens. There's a stone. We hold hands. We say whatever <laughs> chant we're supposed to. And bam, the curse is broken and everything is great. Fun. So we technically ran out of time. But like we were only like a minute over. Ah. Uh, and really, without me, we you, never would have You would have failed. We never would have Never would have broken the curse. And after we went on what we called a food tour. Fun. And we went to different restaurants and had drinks and foods and oh my gosh. all sorts of yummy things. And um, that's when I went into that really old bar I sent you a picture of. Yes. It's one of the oldest bars in the city. Tell people what it's called. The Napoleon. Nice. Pretty sure, 100% sure it's haunted. So we're in this old bar. We were just going to grab some drinks to go because in oh, New Orleans, right. you can carry around drinks. Jeez. That's just amazing. Oh, let me just grab some drinks to go. Yeah. And I got a chocolate cake. <laughs> and I was in heaven. While we were waiting, we were kind of, me and my cousin's girlfriend were kind of peeking around, seeing what the whole place looked like. It was very, very cool. There was an open courtyard. They had all these old fold, old, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Short-circuited. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. It has old photos. <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard to say. <laughs> so we're standing in the courtyard and there's stairs. We're looking at the stairs. My cousin's girlfriend, her name is Rachel. She says, I really, like, really want to go see what's up there. I said, yeah, me too. Wow. Well, here's the thing. She goes, well, but can we? I said, there is no rope that says do not enter. <laughs> if so they didn't want us to rain. go up. Like, we can pretty much do whatever we want to do. So we asked some, like, random waiter what was up there. And he was like, oh, it's just, like, a space used for parties. And we're like, okay, cool. Yeah, we can go up there. So we do. It was a beautiful space, truly historic. But you walk into these rooms and I'm like, all of it haunted. Every single inch right now. We're not going to look in any mirrors. <laughs> in fact, we walked by one and it's like Rachel scared herself from her own <laughs> reflection. <laughs> it was my fault because I kept saying, like, yep, this place is haunted. For sure it's haunted. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, even just your pictures made it. Did You're it like, look yeah. creepy? Yes. Like, I took the picture, and I'm like, it really does look beautiful when you're up there, but the picture, beautiful. it looks creepy as hell. Haunted. One of the ladies at church, she was passing around, like, the basket thing where you put money into, mm-hmm. and she goes, nice ink. I said, thank you. Thank you. It was the highlight of my trip. I didn't burn when I came in here. Thanks. Yep. Yep. All good. Oh, when I was doing some stuff for the podcast and looking up sources, my grandma was sitting next to me and I showed her how we have those subscriptions to the newspaper oh, archive thingies. Mm-hmm. And so I started like trying to look her up and I ended up finding her and my grandfather's engagement announcement Aww, and marriage announcement. How cute. Right? And I also found out that my grandparents' house is 100 years old. Oh, that's cool. And immediately when I asked my grandma that and I'm like putting it – because I've known that they've lived there as long as I can remember. It's right. not the house that my dad grew up in, but it's the house that I grew up in. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I know it's at least almost 30. <laughs> at a minimum. At a minimum. 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 And so I had a feeling I would regret asking. And so I was like, Grandma, how, how old is this house? Actually, it'll be 100 this year. And I'm like, oh, cool. Oh, haunted house. Great. I'm like trying to think back to any – I can't remember anything happening. It's such an old house and creaks all the time anyway that it's really hard to tell right. the difference between if someone's walking around. So a ghost is like, I've been making damn footsteps every <laughs> night and she's not picking it up. Pretty much. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was fun. I like how my family, you know, will sit around the dinner table after we're finished eating and just like exchange stories and mm-hmm. reminisce about things. Found out that my grandfather was actually arrested. In Russia. What? <laughs> <laughs> he was there for the International Math Conference. Oh. At the time, 1964, ironically connects to my case, you'll oh. see. Um, yeah. you you'll know, see, don't worry. Space race, big deal. He was in Russia for it. He was sponsored by the university he worked at. He was walking around and he was taking a picture of the jail because he thought that the architecture was interesting. And you're allowed to do that? I guess not because they, like... Took him in to said jail <laughs> that he just took oh, a picture geez. of. <laughs> and, you know, trying to figure out, like, who he is, mm-hmm. what he's doing. You know, they thought maybe he was, like, a spy or something. Right. And I'm like, oh, well, my grandfather being a spy. <laughs> and it got sorted out and everything was fine. Well, he comes home and I guess, like, my grandma has been dealing with, like, sick children. And so she lugs them all to the airport. He gets off the airplane. He's wearing this big, thick winter jacket because he was just in Russia. Mm -hmm. My grandma was like, well, I kept telling him to take his jacket off because he's like, you're going to be so hot. Like, you need." And he's like, no, no, I'm not going to take it off. I'm not going to take it off. So they get out of the airport. They're like, I don't know if they're almost to the car or where they are, but she's like, you you have to take the jacket off. It is too hot. And he's like, okay. And he takes the jacket off and out comes two bottles of vodka that he smuggled from Russia. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so he gets put in jail for taking a picture of a jail because they thought he was a spy at a math conference at a math conference <laughs> he gets out whatever conference goes as i think it's supposed to that wasn't the point of the story <laughs> and he's probably comes, like i am invincible and then he decides well let me just smuggle these bottles of vodka back to my country that is so funny I, it was the first time i'd ever heard that story and i was like oh my God, like Don't my you love the family stories like that. Yes. And I think it was like the first time that like even my dad had heard it too. Oh my gosh. And who, oh my God, we were dying. That's it, so fun. And you would have loved this part. I'm drinking my little glass of wine 
And it's little, you know, it's like the old lady crystal. So it's, it's little glass. Yes. My aunt says something that, you know, makes me do my snort laugh. <laughs> it wasn't even that funny. But the problem was is that my wine was very close to my <gasps> face. And so as I snort laugh, it splashes <laughs> all up into my face. <laughs> Which, of course, sent everybody into hysterics. And I was like, I did that on purpose. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Comedic timing. Yes. <laughs> Thank God no one actually got a video of it, and it will only be my family. Seared into everyone's memory. Who's witness. <laughs> but it was a wonderful trip. I, I had so much fun being with my family. Um, but yeah, how was your Christmas? It was great. We had everyone over here. We First have time family. having Christmas here? No, in you this had, apartment. Well, yeah, in this apartment. We've but, hosted three years, so okay. this was the third year doing it. It was really good. It was really fun. Do anything special? No, we just ate, drank, opened presents, you know, do you, typical thing. So, okay, do you do... We like, do presents first. Okay, when do you have dinner? Everyone came over at about 11.30. Mm -hmm. We did presents right after that, and we ate probably around two or three. Oh, yeah, we did the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was really, really good. It oh, was really fun. fun. Yeah. So you and Joe cooked? So mom ordered a ham online. Okay. And then her and my brother are very proud of the fact that they made bread one day. And so they made bread again. It was delicious, actually. <laughs> oh, good. Like dough, everything. Yeah. Like they made the bread. Grew um, the wheat and everything. Grew the wheat and everything. <laughs> and then they brought like mac and cheese. Joe and I made a couple sides. My grandma made dessert. Yeah. Yeah, because we always have a chocolate log Ooh. that my grandpa used to make. My grandma now makes it. And what's yeah. really funny, and I'm really sorry if people are religious, but I don't know where, but at some point we found a Jesus head. <laughs> and so now the Jesus head goes on the chocolate log every year. <laughs> You know what? That's okay because it's... Do you want to see the Jesus head? Yes, I do. <laughs> it's okay because, you know, in New Orleans, to celebrate Mardi Gras, they have a king cake, and they put a little plastic baby in the king cake. So it's fine. Jesus head. Oh, my God. This is way bigger than I anticipated. It, <laughs> it is, definitely broke off of a Jesus body. This is an adult Jesus. Uh -huh, yeah, it's like a, like a Jesus. We don't know where the body is, don't know where we got the head, but now it goes on the cake every year. <laughs> How long have you been putting it on the cake? Years. <laughs> Years. Very long time. Let <laughs> me go put him back so he's not sitting on this table as we talk about things. <laughs> he won not approve. <laughs> so do you have like a big Christmas Eve dinner too or no? Nope. No. We used to go to my other grandma's house on Christmas Eve, but we didn't go this year. Mm -hmm. So Joe and I just like chilled, watched TV. Nice. I edited a little bit. You know. Yeah. But yeah, so it was really good. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right. So we've been talking. So should we jump into the oh, facts? Yeah. Heads up. This is going to be long. Yeah. We got some pretty good cases coming up. We do. So it's worth the length that it'll turn out to be, which we don't even know yet. <laughs> we never know until <laughs> until I look at everything together and I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> but, you know, these, these ones are good. I don't even know what Lauren's is about and I know that it's good. <laughs> oh, it is good. <laughs> All right. So some facts. New Year Festival, any of the social, cultural, and religious observations worldwide that celebrate... Observances. What did I say? Observations. Oh. New Year Festival, any of the social, cultural, and religious ob observances... <laughs> observances? <laughs> There's always one damn word. <laughs> observances worldwide that celebrate go. the beginning of the new year are among the oldest and the most universally observed... The earliest known record of a New Year festival dates from around 2000 BCE in Mesopotamia, where in Babylonia, the New Year, Akitu, began with the new moon after the spring equinox, mid-March, and the Assyria with mm -hmm. the new moon nearest the autumn equinox, mid-September. On the Roman Republican calendar, the year began on March 1st, a day before my birthday. Mm -hmm. But after 153 BCE, the official date was January 1st, which was continued in the Julian calendar of 46 BCE interesting mm -hmm. that would suck to have my year birthday like right at the new year yeah oh i put there's lots of facts lots of historical facts the gregorian calendar adopted in 1582 by the roman catholic church restored january 1st as new year's day and most european countries gradually followed suit scotland in 1660 germany and denmark in 1700 england in 1752 and russia in 1918 1918 that's wild so just a scotch over a hundred years ago, Russia's like, fine, we'll go with your calendar. That's weird. Isn't that crazy? So what calendar were they using? God knows. I have no idea. No, but like months would still be the same and years would still be the same, right? 
because I'm thinking of like any of the cases well, we've covered in Russia before 1918 or like right after that time. They, it might have been, but there were some places like in some of the Asian cultures, they only had like 354 days or something oh, like that. Interesting. So, huh. yeah, I guess as a society, eventually we all caved and we're like, fine, we'll go with that one. When are we going to do that with the metric system? Well, I think we should at least keep temperature the same. Well, duh. temperature should be Fahrenheit because Celsius doesn't make a so confusing. Lick of fucking sense. I understand the zero and I understand the one hundred. That makes That's a lot of sense. It, but there's a lot of stuff that can go on in between right. there where it's like that doesn't make much sense. Correct. Ours makes much more sense. It does. A hundred hot, zero <laughs> cold, thirty-two freezing. <laughs> I'll give them like measurements. Definitely be nice if we had like base ten, but. Mm. Eh. we at least need to keep our temperature yes I agree. <laughs> those religions and cultures using a lunar calendar have continued to observe the beginning of the year on days other than january 1st in the jewish religious calendar for example the year begins on rosh hashanah beautiful thank you the first day of the month of tishri sure <laughs> <laughs> you should be the expert in this i didn't it, that's why i have that mug that like has the fake newspaper article where it says Jews and Gentiles aren't sure when Hanukkah will start, but oh. they know that it'll start at some point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you're Jewish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so that time falls between <laughs> September 6th and October 5th. The Muslim calendar normally has 354 days in there each year, with the new year beginning on the month of Muharram. The Chinese New Year is celebrated officially for a month beginning in late January or early February. I didn't realize it was celebrated for so long. Yeah, that's a very long time. Yeah. One day is enough. <laughs> in southern India, the Tamils celebrate the new year at the winter solstice. Tibetans observe the day in February. And in Thailand, the day is celebrated in March or April. The Japanese have a three-day celebration January 1st to the 3rd. See, three days. I could handle three days. Absolutely. Anything more than that, that's just a little bit much. I'm too Well, old. Mardi Gras is technically like two weeks. <laughs> could you imagine? No. <laughs> I drank for the past like two days and I'm like, I can't. <laughs> I've been hung over like for two days in a row. <laughs> Well, that's what you get for trying to race chasing a beer. Oh, my God. Or that, chugging a beer. so funny. <laughs> uh, the average number of births per year on New Year's Eve is 10,394, making it one of the rarest birthdays in the United States. That sounded like a really big number. Right? Until you said rare. I had literally the same exact thought. I'm like, wow. Oh, wait. That's not a high number. Apparently Apparently not. not. So I guess what's it was March you would have gotten pregnant? April. April, you would have gotten pregnant. Mm -hmm. April to May time. Well, if you're a teacher, spring break. <laughs> <laughs> or just anyone else, just, hey, it's a nice Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it could just be a nice Tuesday. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, the Times Square ball drop for New Year's Eve has happened since 1907. The only time it didn't drop was in 1942 and 1943 due to the United States entering World War II. Interesting. Mm -hmm. However, people still went to Times Square for New Year's Eve. But instead of a ball drop, they celebrated the holiday with a moment of silence followed by the ringing of chimes from sound trucks. That's cute. Mm -hmm. That oh. war we were supportive of. It was the ones afterwards that were like, mm. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> History, man. Yeah. Kissing on New Year's Eve is popular because of Hollywood films and German folklore. It's believed that a New Year's Eve kiss can strengthen your relationship with your partner. Oh, what? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> People in Denmark keep older damaged plates to break on New Year's Eve to show affection to their family and friends. Now that I would love to do. That would be fun. Yes. Do you ever get just like the feeling where you just have something glass and you just want to drop it and see what happens? No. Oh. <laughs> I have that feeling when I'm mad and I really just want to throw something. Oh, yeah. At work, I have this, like, glass present and it has, like, lights on the inside and it lights up. It's, like, a cute decoration. There's so many times that people come to my desk and they're like, do you ever just want to drop this? And I'm like, all the time. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't get those urges to just randomly drop something. Only glass, though, because I want to see it shatter. Okay, weirdo. No, it's a normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> she says with confidence. <laughs> The Chinese have started the tradition of making noise and lighting fireworks on New Year's Eve to prevent bad luck and remove evil spirits. I also like that one. Mm -hmm. Latin Americans believe that the color of your underwear on New Year's Eve determines what will happen the following year. For example, wearing blue underwear is good for health, while red underwear is good for love. Huh. I'll have to be very precarious about what underwear I wear. I wonder what black is. 
I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> or multicolored. <laughs> More fireworks are sold on Independence Day than on New Year's Eve in the United States. Which makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But just a random fact. <laughs> yeah, just random. <laughs> the last time a blue moon occurred on New Year's Eve was in 1990, and the next time it will happen will be in 2028. Wow. Mm-hmm. On December 30th, 1977, Ted Bundy made a second escape from prison. At least 48% of parents plan to count down at 9 p.m. with their kids. <laughs> Have you seen those cute videos where parents will, like, do a countdown and they'll pretend it's midnight and then they'll have the kids go to bed and then they actually (laughs) stay up? (laughs) I get it. I would do that. That's so funny. Wallet have reported that 12% of Americans fall asleep before midnight anyway, my mom being one of them. (laughs) A million people flock to Times Square to see the ball drop. The ball weighs 11,875 pounds and is covered in 2,688 Waterford crystal triangles. Wow. More than 53 tons of trash are left in Times Square after the celebrations, including 1.5 tons of confetti. It takes 300 sanitation workers between 12 and 16 hours to clean it all up. Jeez. My uncle used to do the lights in the ball. Really? Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Yeah, man. Did he have to do it, like, up high? I don't know. My mom has been the one to always tell me that fact. I've never (laughs) asked him, actually. (laughs) Oh, that's cool. So... So, randomly, another weird fact I read when I was deciding what story to cover was if you do your laundry on the first of the year, that's also a bad, like, that's a bad thing. Like, you should wait to do your laundry until January 2nd because Mm -hmm. it's, like, doing it on the first is, like, you're washing away good luck and you're, like, washing away a family member, meaning that someone in your family will die. (laughs) That's a bit intense. I don't know which culture it's from, but I was just thinking, well, that's not my belief. So if I wash laundry, it's okay. <laughs> so it doesn't count for me. Right, exactly. I don't believe. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but wow, New Year's, man. New Year's, man. All right. What tea are you pouring? No. Yeah. 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 What tea are you pouring, Lauren? <laughs> yeah, there we go. I wanted to say today, but I realized that that wouldn't work. What tea are you pouring today, Lauren? <laughs> not, not as much. <laughs> so not as much. <laughs> I want to start off by saying. I have a notepad and a pen. <laughs> Good, because I apologize now, and I will say it now. Okay. This case goes all over the place, and I will answer any and all questions you have. Okay. I see you brought a notepad and a pen. Very smart. You might need it. Um, So when I first decided what I was going to do, I saw this, and I was like, oh, this sounds awesome. So I, like, started typing up stuff, and then I got to a paragraph in an article, and I was like, this is the most controversial case in all of New Zealand. And I'm like, damn. (laughs) But I was too far in to stop at that point. Sure. I had already been doing it for like a couple hours. I was yeah. like a lot of pages in. I was like, can't get, can't back out now. I gotta keep going. Yeah. So sorry if you're in New Zealand and you know this case. I have never heard of it before. So it is probably new to us in the US. Very well known in New Zealand. Yeah. So Very much apologize. New Zealanders, you can skip ahead to my story. <laughs> or you can listen. Or you can listen. Maybe you've never heard of it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so I know we like to do cases that we don't always know, but I mean we don't. We don't know this one. <laughs> New Zealand is small. I feel like there's going to be many notorious things that happen. Yes. And with this one too, like I said, it's there's so much that goes into this. So this mm-hmm. is kind of like your episode like 101. You know, like when you take a class in college, your 101 is just like a very base of everything. Mm-hmm. This is a 101 of this case. <laughs> okay, yeah. If you want like a 201, go listen to other <laughs> podcasts, YouTube, things like that. <laughs> Because we're just giving you a 101. 102 is only for people who take 101. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, so. It's a prerequisite. <laughs> there. So this is your prerequisite. Okay, wait, wait, wait. My first question, though. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last name situation going on in here? Is it going to be like the last one you did where there's a McLaren and a McClellan and a... Yeah. Really? Yes. Oh, my God. Shockingly, I know. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I'm going to have to write these names down in their so, assigned job. Let me introduce the case. Okay. So this is the disappearance of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. Okay. 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 Oh, Olivia Pope. That's... <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, isn't that someone famous? <laughs> and it's, it is, but it's Olivia Pope. But yeah, not who I'm talking about. Nope. Okay. So Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. Is Ben Smart related to Elizabeth Smart? See, I don't think so. <laughs> but I was like, oh, the smart last name. Yeah. All right. So it was New Year's Eve. Shocking mm-hmm. that we're doing it for our New Year's crime. Um, not really, because that was the whole purpose. <laughs> I need like a little squirt gun or something to just. Tss, tss. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ben Smart is 21 mm-hmm. and Olivia Hope, 17, okay. are two young New Zealanders. So they were planning on attending an all night party at 
for New Lounge mm-hmm. in Endeavor Inlet in the Marl... What's the girl's name again? Marlboro Sounds. Olivia Hope. Hope. So this is located at the northern part of the South Island of New Zealand. Okay. It was December 31st, 1997, and the two friends, Ben and Olivia, were ready to celebrate and welcome in the new year of 1998. Oh, are they not dating? No, they're just friends. Okay. So they're going to celebrate with 1,500 to 2,000 other partygoers. Damn. So this lodge where this thing's happening, huge party thing, obviously with that many people. I would hope so. Hope and Smart planned to meet up at the party, both arriving separately. So Hope arrived there with a group, including her sister, on a chartered yacht, the Tamarack. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because they're at an inlet. Just so really show up to a party on, on a yacht. yacht. <laughs> she then traveled by water taxi to Endeavor Inlet, where the lodge was located. Ben Smart was staying at a batch nearby. So I learned that? that a batch is a holiday or summer home in New Zealand. Like, oh. it's just like a very common name. It's just summer, called a batch. A summer home. You don't need to write that down. <laughs> oh, I'm writing it down. <laughs> so they're rich. Yep. Yeah, at... The batch house or the batch. <laughs> All right. So smart arrives separately. Hope's already there. Cool beans. They meet up. Partying commences. So finally at around 4 a.m., the <gasps> party was starting to wind down. <laughs> <laughs> starting? I know. Starting? I was like, 4 a.m.? I would already want to be in bed sleeping. Oh, my God. The amount. Mm. They are 17 and 21. So. I could do it. At that age, I could have done it. it. At this age, so the two headed back to the yacht, the Tamarack, where they intended to sleep for the night. So they arrived on board, and when they did so, they discovered that others had taken their booked place on the boat's berths. So a berth is a cabin. Okay. So someone had taken their spot that they had scheduled. Okay. So there's more than just them on the the boat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So I don't know what the two decided to do, but at that time, a water taxi being driven by bartender Guy Wallace. Write that down. Okay. (laughs) I need a new pen. Mine's running out of ink, even though I just got it. You okay. <laughs> I thought you were about to pull a pen out of the tree. <laughs> no. <laughs> Next to the tree. Okay. Guy Wallace, bartender and taxi driver. Yep. Water taxi. Okay, keep going. All right. So this water taxi was passing by, so Smart and Hope got on board. Wallace had been bartending at the party that the parrot attended. Mm-hmm. There were also three other passengers on board at the time. You don't have to write this down. Okay. <laughs> Hayden Morrissey, Sarah Dyer, and an unidentified man. Okay. So the five of them got to talking, and the unidentified man ended up offering Smart and Hope a place to stay for the night. Mm. He was heading back to his yacht, and he said that the two of them could sleep there. He had plenty of extra room. Wallace let Smart, Hope, and the unidentified man off at the man's yacht, then continued on where he dropped the remaining two passengers off at their batch. Strange man's yacht. <laughs> this ended up being the last time that Smart and Hope were seen alive. So on January 2nd, 1998, the duo were reported missing by Gerald Hope, Olivia's father. I'm sorry. What date? January 2nd, 1998. Oh, I thought you said 22nd. <laughs> no, January 2nd. Okay. Uh, they were reported missing by Olivia's dad. Mm-hmm. It was after Olivia's sister noticed that she hadn't returned to the yacht the night before. Because remember, she got oh, there with her. Oh, yeah. The case was first Why viewed. Why didn't she just bunk with her sister? I don't know. Okay. No one asked. <laughs> True. The case was first viewed as a missing persons case Mm -hmm. by the Blenheim police, but it soon became very apparent that this needed to be looked further into. Mm -hmm. Like something like this was completely out of character for the two. Mm -hmm. If they had gone somewhere else, they would have informed family. Like it was definitely more than just a missing persons report. Something sus. So their disappearance was that much more suspicious. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Something sus. Hmm. So on January 5th, the case was given to Detector Inspector Rob Pope. Detector Inspector. Oh God, we have an Olivia Hope and we have a Rob Pope. (sighs) Rob Pope, Inspector Detector. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So he was given the case to take charge of it. At this point, it was considered a homicide investigation. They haven't technically confirmed that they're dead. Right. Got it. They're just missing. And based on who they are as people. It's presumed dead. And also remember, this is New Zealand. So very different from how we run things here. True. So a mix of police staff from across the country joined in on the investigation as well. And it was soon given the case code name of Operation TAM. Short for Tamarack. Fair. Even Uh, though they weren't on the Tamarack. Yeah, that's where they were going back to. Well, that's where they should have been. Right, so that's why it was called that, because that's like kind of the main boat of this story. Okay. So Operation Tam became the largest police investigation ever conducted by New Zealand police at the time. Damn. About 1,600 people who were in the Marlboro Sounds at the time were contacted and questioned. Sure. And more than 100 vessels were identified and traced. There were requests to the public for any and all information. Numerous interviews took place all over the county, and the waters around the Endeavor Inlet were searched extensively. 
A sonar search was conducted at the entrance of Tory Channel, which I I guess must be the starting point for where this inlet is. Mm -hmm. Um, It was an area of interest to the police as a possible place where the bodies of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope could potentially be. Mm. But that search found, quote, no indication that the missing remains of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope are present or visible on the seabed inside the search area. Okay. So no body, still kind of not really knowing what they're doing. Yeah. All right, so we have to go over some of the people who were questioned and looked into. Okay, I'm ready. So, of course, we have Guy Wallace. Guy Wallace. Our bartender. Check. He was driving the water taxi the night that Hope and Smart go onto after they realized they didn't have a place to stay that night. Question. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wallace was interviewed twice by police. Twice. Once on the 3rd of January and once on the 5th. Two. So I will say that some of the dates around this time get a little muddled just because Operation Tam started, like, really kicked off on January 5th. That's Mm -hmm. when it became the murder investigation. But it was, like, investigations were starting beforehand when it kind of was brought to the public, like, brought to the police's attention on January 2nd. Okay. So in his statement to police, Wallace was able to describe the unidentified man who Hope and Smart left with. Okay. He said that the man, between 30 and 32 years old, had two days' growth on his face. Possibly. That's hella specific. You know, some shadow of something. How old is he? Uh, they believe, he believes between 30 and 32. Hella specific. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Possibly arm tattoos. He had a wiry build, was 5'9", short, dark, wavy hair, scruffy in appearance, and was wearing a Levi shirt with jeans. Oh my God, is this your brother? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh my God. <laughs> Especially because he just shaved his beard. So he does have like a couple days growth. I will say he doesn't have a wiry build though. (laughs) So Wallace confirmed that this man who had been on the taxi, who had he had given a ride to, was the same man that he and his staff had served at the lounge earlier that evening. Okay. So he's like, I served this guy when I was a bartender. He came on my water taxi. Yeah. Same guy. Still unidentified, but same guy. Okay. He told the police and the media that he had dropped off Hope Smart and this unidentified man at a wooden catch. So a catch is a boat that has two masts. Okay. It's just like a name for a boat. Got it. When he had his interviews with authorities on January 3rd, Wallace drew a sketch of the boat where he dropped the three off. So he drew a yacht with two masts, wrote, quote, 38 to 40 foot catch, question mark, on the drawing, mm-hmm. and underlined the word catch twice. Okay. So we're not sure if he's like questioning the catch, if it was a catch, if he was questioning the 38 to 40 foot length of it. Sure. But so that's what he wrote on the picture. Okay. He said that it was well maintained, built of timber with a thick blue stripe on the hull and several round portholes with brass surrounds. He said that it was rafted in a group between three to five other vessels. Okay. So it's in the water. It's near three other five, three to five vessels. This is what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Wallace seemed to provide us with a good amount of information on what this unidentified man looked like and what the boat looked like. Mm-hmm. Going off of this information, police analyzed thousands of vessels, talked to thousands of skippers, and looked at thousands of photos that had been taken on New Year's Eve. But even with all of that, they were unable to corroborate Wallace's reports of a catch that had been on the inlet that night. Hmm. So he had described what this boat was, but they have not had any way to verify that this boat was on the water. So this is where it gets a little odd. So on January 9th, police had interviewed a man named Scott Watson. Write that down. I'm writing, I'm writing. That's why we have Watson and Wallace. So I was like, gotta write this down. Jesus. (laughs) Hope and Pope. My God. All right. During these interviews, photos of Watson have been taken. Okay. So I guess this had been the common practice that police use. They interview someone, they take pictures. Okay. Whoever they thought was connected to the case. So Wallace, the taxi driver, was Mm -hmm. interviewed again on January 11th in a three and a half hour interview. Damn. He was shown photos of this Watson guy Mm -hmm. to see if maybe he recognized the unidentified man. Like, trying to see if, like, is Watson this unidentified guy you remember on your boat? So Wallace took a look at the photo montages of this Watson guy and said that he didn't recognize anyone in the photos. Okay. The police then changed the photo of Watson to a different one in which he had his eyes half closed. That Watson did? Yeah. A picture of Watson with his eyes half closed. This photo became known as the blink photo because he's, like, sort of blinking, Blinking? so his eyes are half closed. Yeah, yeah. So it gives his eyes a different appearance. So just fast-forwarding a couple months to keep talking about this picture. So on mm-hmm. April 20th, 1998, Wallace was shown this new montage of photos. So with the blink photo mm-hmm. and we'll call this one montage B. Mm-hmm. So not making the connection between the two montages he had seen, Wallace looked at B and said that the man in these photos could be the mystery man who had been on the boat that night. Mm-hmm. He said that quote, the eyes were the same as the man he had seen on that night, referring to the hooded eyes that both men had. But he said that the mystery man had longer and bushier hair and had been unshaven. Okay. So oh, that is Watson, how do you spell mystery? watson was not unshaven watson was very clean shaven okay and kind of had 
not as bushy hair. So that's Got why it. this guy is saying like this mystery man though had longer hair, was bushy, yeah, unshaven. Yeah, yeah. So kind of the opposite of what this Watson guy was. Okay, so close but not quite. Right. Rosalind Ross McNeely, a bar manager who had also been working on New Year's Eve at the lodge, had sh- um, was shown pictures of Watson as well, mainly Montage B, so the blank photo. Mm-hmm. She identified him the same way that Wallace had. So pretty much saying like they look similar, but the guy, you know, this Watson guy didn't look like that. Like they had some differences. So back to January 12th, a vessel was seized by the police, but the one that was seized was a surprise to many. The vessel that was seized belonged to a man named Scott Watson. Scott? Yes. Have you been saying that? Yeah. For some reason, I thought I heard Sam. Nope. Scott. (laughs) Scott Watson. I wrote it down as Scott, so we're okay. Perfect. So he owned a sloop, which is a small square rigged sailing vessel. (laughs) So these sloops (laughs) usually will have one, two, or three masts. His specifically was named Blade. That's Uh what he called it, and this is where he lived. Uh It was small, only about 26 feet, had a steel hull, not timber, had no portholes, no blue stripe, and only had one mast. Uh So very different from the other one. The the description. Yes. So I even looked at a picture of a computer-generated photo of what the catch looked like, the one with the blue stripe, Uh and the actual photo of the blade. Uh They look nothing alike. Like, mm. nothing at all. Wallace later said that the only similarity between the catch he described and the blade were that both they both float. So, no similarity. So, the news of this kind of ship that Wallace had explained had gotten out to the public. Mm-hmm. So, even though a vessel had been seized, over the next few weeks, many calls came into the police of sightings of a two-masted catch in the Marlboro Sounds area. One of those calls coming from a former police officer with 40 years of experience. So, all very legit, yeah. real calls. Credible people. Yes. A number of these witnesses said that after they called to report what they saw, they were told that their information was not wanted or their statements were just never followed up on. Figured it out. What? It's sus that the police are pushing this Watson guy. Mm-hmm. Because the, both people are like, it's close, but it's not quite. Keep that in your mind. I know, I did. I wrote it down and underlined it and circled it. <laughs> <laughs> So former detective Mike Chappell, you don't need to write his name, okay. <laughs> who had worked on this case later confessed and claimed that officers were told to not follow up on any sightings that were reported of two mast catches because they already had their vessel. Mm-hmm. Police did try to point to why they had this interest in the blade and why they seized it to kind of like prove like, oh, this is why we're not looking at anything else. Yeah, yeah. So they said that they had this growing interest in Watson. The blade had been moored in the same area where Wallace claimed to have dropped off Smart and Hope, and there were no other witnesses to confirm the existence of another catch. Okay. Mm, which was all not really true. No. So <laughs> let's talk about Scott Watson. Okay. So he's 27 years old. Mm-hmm. He was Caucasian, 5'9", with dark brown hair and forearm tattoos. Okay. So he kind of matches the description of who Wallace had given us at the beginning. Sure. But he was a pretty prime suspect. He was pretty much put on the radar after he drew a bit of attention to himself by being loud, belligerent, intoxicated, and rude to those who were at the lodge on the night of the party. Okay. So he made himself known that he was there, and he, uh, already there, is not a great person, Uh, but he also had a criminal record with 48 criminal convictions. Oi, yay, (laughs) yay! Mainly from when he was a teenager, and these charges were for burglary, theft, cannabis offenses, two counts of possessing an offense. cannabis is fuck. But by then. They don't count. (laughs) (laughs) Two counts of possessing an offensive weapon, and one for assault back when he was 16. So he also had a reputation of being an asshole intimidating and threatening women so he is a jerk but not necessarily the the jerk we're looking for so we're not sure Mm. so between the years of 1989 and 1990 watson had been in prison twice for two short periods but by 1997 it seemed that he had cleaned up his act completely only having one conviction between 1990 and 1998 okay that's good so he was pretty yeah pretty chill i mean he was still kind of like a dick an asshole rude awful to women but he wasn't doing criminal things anymore sure one step at a time yes so when police seized his boat blade on january 12th he was obviously interviewed and the detective who took this on was detective tom fitzgerald you don't need to write this down okay it was within this first week of investigations and interviews that fitzgerald made it clear that police were considering watson as their main suspect so naturally because he was being looked into because his boat was seized and because a search warrant had been executed on the homes of his parents and his sister damn mm mm-hmm rumors started to swirl about watson in his hometown of picton But that is not all. This story and Watson, as our main suspect, had made its way into the media, of course. Of course. So after a six-month investigation on June 15th, 1998, Watson was arrested for the murders of Brian Smart and Olivia Hope. So I know that sounds really quick. Obviously, I'll kind of get into it a little bit. 
But this is pretty bad because he was arrested while there were still hundreds of other individuals who had not yet been interviewed. Oh. Mm-hmm. So they had all these potential suspects who they could interview. Nope. They're so they stick with had Watson. a vendetta for sure. It Yeah. And what's unfair, Mike White, or a journalist, brought this more to light. So Watson's yacht was pulled from the water in January in full view of any bystanders and media person who wanted to see it. I just want vendetta. I, don't know. I can't help you with that one. Spell these words. So from that date to his arrest, so a six-month period, police allowed unsubstantiated gossip about Watson and his family to circulate. Mm. So Watson would later say that police were influencing media coverage of the case from the very beginning. Rumors came out that the whole Watson family were criminals, and then Scott and his sister were having an incestuous relationship. Ew! Oh my god! Yes. And obviously they're, like, denying this. Sure. Gerald Hope, Olivia's father, also said that police deliberately leaked details of Watson's criminal history and were also responsible for the untrue incest claims. So he's even saying, like, what you're saying is a lie. Yeah. Watson also said that police were following and intimidating his family. He said they were tapping his phone, which is true. So they had his phone tapped from February until he was arrested in an operation called Operation Zelt. They love operation names. I can see that. They recorded over 70 hours of conversation. Mm -hmm. So here's the kind of scummy part. So they got Watson's former girlfriend to try to ask him questions, hoping that he would incriminate himself. It never happened. Yeah, because there was nothing to incriminate. Right. So in an interview that Mike White had with Paul Henry, a morning news and talk talk show person, he agreed that the media was manipulated. And in them being manipulated, the public was as well. So he's Mm -hmm. saying kind of the police were manipulating media. Yep. And media is pushing that out. You can't have a fair trial. Exactly. He said, quote, I don't think the media asked enough questions. We were thinking that we had to support the police and we were doing the right thing by doing that. Mm. So, of course, no one's questioning anything because this yeah, is what they're hearing. It's supposed to be a person of authority. And naturally, police denied all of these rumors and denied that they spread anything. But Gerald Hope, Olivia's father, even said that the police were constantly telling him and his family how horrible and bad the Watsons were. And mm-hmm. Watson had been told by his lawyer to not speak publicly about anything. Mm-hmm. So the media only had the police's side of everything and yeah. were not able to get Watson's side. So he only had one-sided comments from the police and from the victim's family. So that's all that's being circulated. Yeah. Nothing from Watson's side of anything. Yeah. So the trial of Scott Watson began on June 10th, 1999. During the 11-week trial, 488 witnesses were called forward by the Crown. So think of the Crown as the prosecution. Yeah, I figured. Yes. The defense only called 26. So the Crown claimed that Watson had invited Hope and Smart to sleep on his yacht in the early hours of January 1st, 1998, and that this was the last time they had been seen. So that's kind of what we know for sure, or supposedly. What we supposedly know for sure. Yeah. But Don Anderson, another water taxi driver, was called to testify, and he testified that he had given a ride to a lone man who had matched Scott's description to a vessel, quote, with the name of a sharp-edged weapon, so the blade, between 2 and 4 a.m. So not him. So some occupants on the neighboring boats, the Mina Cornelia and the Bianca, also testified that they had been woken up in the early hours of the morning by Watson, who wanted to continue partying. So he's just being obnoxious and asking people if they want to keep partying at, like, between 2 and 4 a.m. So kind of after the time frame that we have being after Smart and Hope got back, like, had yeah, gone yeah, to their yeah. vessel because they ended up partying around 4. Right. So this is saying he got back to his boat between 2 and 4. Yeah. So the Crown tried to say that after he'd been dropped off by Anderson, Watson somehow got back to shore, but they were unable to say how. They said that after he returned to the shore, he then went back on Wallace's boat. So he got a ride from Tom An- or Don Anderson to his home. He somehow got back to the shore, and then he took the boat again with Wallace, and that's when he was this unidentified man. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. Did I explain that? Okay. Okay. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but it makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so this became known as the two-trip theory. Oh my god, what this is like what the fuck is with these operations and these theories and the name the blink photo. Oh right. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh my god. I know it sounds like a bad police drama. Yes. Yeah. So the clown the crown the clown? The crown. Well <laughs> tried to argue that it did not matter if they were unable to prove how he got to shore, but that he did get back to shore somehow between 3 a.m. and 3:30 a.m. They believe he was actually on shore because witnesses said that Watson had gotten into an altercation on shore with someone, so they could hear the screaming, they could hear the yelling at 3 a.m., but there were no additional witness testimonies or evidence to back any of that up. They then said that sometime before 6 a.m., the blade left its spot at the inlet. They then claimed that, at this time, the bodies of Hope and Smart were on board. They then claimed that Watson dumped the bodies into the Cook Strait, returned to Erie Bay, and then lied about the time he had arrived there. And we have no motive, correct? No motive. Cool beans. We will never have a motive. Excellent. Other than 
hating women. Sure. But then there was a man, so like, right. So a number of witnesses took the stand to testify that they saw the boat at different times throughout the day, Mm -hmm. with one witness saying that the blade arrived in Erie Bay shortly after 5 p.m., and when it did arrive, Watson was the only one on board. Mm -hmm. As we can kind of already see here, much of the Crown's case was circumstantial, with them having a lot of theories about what happened, but no true evidence. So a lot of it's like, well, this is probably what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, he got here somehow, but like, we don't know how, but we know he got there. It's Mm -hmm. like, you're not really proving anything. Yeah. So the only other pieces of evidence they had was testimony from two prisoner informants and the identification of Scott Watson through the photo montages by Guy Wallace and Ros McNeely, which I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So during this time, when the focus was on Watson and he had been arrested, both McNeely and Wallace presented affidavits that claimed that the police had misled them with the photos. (gasps) So Wallace was adamant that the police had misled him over the photo, photo of Watson. He said that he believed Watson was innocent and that the misleading of the photo led to the incarceration of an innocent man. He continuously said that he felt tremendous pressure from the police and the media throughout the investigation. He said that it got really bad when he was interrogated by the detectives from uh, Christchurch CIB back on the interview on January 11th, Uh that three and a half hour interview. Yeah. He said that they suggested that he, Wallace, was somehow responsible for the disappearance of Hope and Smart. (gasps) The detective suggested that Wallace knew Watson and that Wallace was a party to the murder. Though, obviously, the claim was never able to be substantiated and Wallace was never and has never been considered a suspect. Right. But he feels like they were trying to say that to be like, well, it's you unless you can tell us it's someone else. Right. Exactly. Because of these accusations, locals even began treating him with suspicion. And those we thought were friends started to believe that he was, in fact, guilty and they began shunning him. He said that in the initial stages of the investigation, the police were desperate to arrest someone. Yeah. So he said, quote, I know in my heart of hearts, if he, Scott Watson, wasn't in there, I'd be doing time. It's just that simple. Yeah. So he maintained this belief all the way until his death in March of 2021. Oh, my God. And Roz McNeely also ended up recanting her statement after she had seen the photo of Watson taking on the same or taken on the night in question of him being clean shaven. Mm-hmm. So remember how the man Wallace saw, he said, had two days growth on his face. Mm-hmm. Well, both him and McNeely were like not like Watson's clean shaven like this can't be the same man and even with the half shut eyes they were like I mean it's close but it's not quite and with the half shut eyes it's going to make your eyes look hooded right which is they are saying like he had hooded eyes yeah so McNeely ended up signing an affidavit stating that she also made a mistake in identifying Watson Mm -hmm. so I mentioned how the crowd had those two prison informants Mm -hmm. so their names were never released so we'll call them witness a and witness b to keep them straight okay both of these witnesses claimed that while in prison, they met Watson as he was awaiting his trial and all that. So they're all in jail together. They both claimed that Watson told them that he was responsible for Ben and Olivia's disappearance. Uh-huh. But later, Witness A admitted to a number of lawyers on the New Zealand Herald that he had lied in court. Mm. He said that he had lied because at the time he was receiving death threats from a gang member and he was coming up for parole. So he was going to do anything he needed to do to stay safe and get out on parole, like to please the authorities who would be releasing I mean- him. He claimed that over a 12-month period, the period leading up to the trial, police visited him 10 times in prison, pressured him into making false accusations in his testimony. Witness A said that he, quote, chose to help the police in the hope they would be able to save him. Oh, my. Witness B said that he and Watson actually became good friends while they were in Abington prison as they interacted on numerous occasions. Well, in actuality, Witness B was never in the same cell as Watson and, quote, had little opportunity to to develop any close relationship with Watson with Watch. <laughs> had little opportunity to develop any close relationship with Watson such that a confession might be made. So pretty much saying, like, they were never friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were never friends to the point where Watson would be like, yo, I killed these two people. Right. It was later found out and revealed that on his release from prison, Witness B was granted the use of a car and a cell phone for his testimony to police. (gasps) So he was given all these rights if he testified. Bribery. Mm Mm-hmm. These testimonies at the time were described as, quote, a bombshell of evidence and that the testimonies had a dramatic impact on everyone in court. Though, as we can see now, they were obviously coerced confessions and not real or true information. So, okay, questions up to this point. Anything I need to clarify? Again, this is a one-on-one class. Yes, (laughs) and and I've got the case set so far that Mm -hmm. basically it's a whole bunch of hoopla. That's, yeah. Um, And don't don't worry, there's more hoopla. Well, yeah, and so I feel like my question is going to be answered, but later, Mm -hmm. of like, what happens? Yes. Mm-hmm. With this. We will get to that in 101. Okay. So so the Crown didn't have any physical evidence, really, like I said. No right. fingerprints of the victims were found on Watson's boat. The only physical evidence that they were able to produce at the trial related to some human hair that had been found on the boat. Uh-huh. So the Crown claimed that during the police's initial forensic investigation of the blade, they had found a blanket. A blanket? A blanket. Okay. This blanket had a number of human hairs on it, about 400. 
And I'm like, that's a lot of human hairs to have on a blanket. Sounds like dog hair. Right, like Roy's blanket, I bet, doesn't even have 400 pieces (laughs) of hair. The initial forensic examination isolated 11 of those hairs, hoping to test the DNA to see if it matched Olivia's, but none of them did. Samples of Olivia's hair were later obtained from Olivia's family home and sent to the laboratory. The blanket was then again examined, and this time, miraculously, two more blonde hairs were found on it that seemingly were overlooked the first time. Oh my god, now they are literally... What is it? Not forging evidence, but... Like planting? Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. So Susan Wittener, a forensic biologist, testified and stated that through DNA testing, they confirmed that one of the hairs found matched Olivia Hope, or at least someone of her maternal bloodline, which wasn't a thing before. Mm -hmm. This mitochondrial DNA analysis of the hair was conducted in both Australia and the UK. Mm -hmm. So sounds pretty open and shut, right? Hair matching Olivia, we got this, we're good. Sure. Well, this is where it gets even more shady. So police never received the level of validation that they wanted from the tests to be like 100% this is confirmation that this hair belonged to Olivia, but they still presented the results as evidence in the trial. Uh-uh. So naturally, the defense, Watson's counsel, questioned the chain of custody of that hair. Good. So they stated that maybe Vintner mixed up the hair samples by examining known hair from Olivia on the same table and on the same day that they examined the samples taken from the blade. Mm-hmm. So maybe they just got mixed up. Oh, now it's a match. Especially because the actual hairs from Olivia's house were never counted. So there was no way to know, like, oh, we have five here and we still have five. Yeah. There's no way to know. So maybe yeah. you had five and now, oh, you have four. What happened to that other one? You know what I right. mean? Right, right. So they also pointed out that there was a one centimeter hole in the evidence bag that contained Olivia's hair, which could add to the risk of contamination. Yeah. So Vittner did testify that cross-contamination is an explanation that needs to be considered. Uh-huh. So, again... We're still not having any, like, solid, like, right. like groundbreaking evidence. Like, if I was on this evidence. jury, I'd be like, okay, so he didn't do it. Right. So throughout everything, Watson had been unwavering in his claims of his innocence, and his story never changed. Mm-hmm. He claimed over and over again that he returned to the Blade alone at 2 a.m. He slept, then departed the inlet in the Blade at 7 a.m. the next morning. Even with all of this shady and circumstantial evidence, in September of 1999, after an 11-week-long trial, Watson was convicted of the murders of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope Idiots. and was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 17 years. So again, we're in New Zealand, not the U.S. So he has to serve 17, and then he can start doing, like, parole hearings to, like, try to get paroled. I mean, I don't think he did it, so I'm like, cool, he can get out. But if he did do it 17 years and you murdered two people? And- mm-hmm. Right, like, right. Um- <laughs> so when the verdict was read, Watson had told the jury, you're wrong, and he has been holding on to his innocence ever since. So we have some aftermath stuff Mm. so in 2015 watson was interviewed by mike white our journalist okay and told him that quote he feels he was picked out by the police from all the people who were at lodge that night Mm -hmm. he feels he was focused on very early and the police pursued him despite there being no evidence and made a case against him and convinced many of the witnesses to give evidence against him or or perhaps twist some of the evidence Mm -hmm. it's kind of what we said it seems like they had like you said a vendetta against him from the very beginning and they're just trying to find the evidence to kind of support their story rather than finding evidence to find the killer Correct. After the trial and the years following, Gerald Hope spoke out and expressed his concerns over the investigation and the trial. He told Mike White that he felt, quote, very uncomfortable with the way the Crown ran the case. Hope said that the whole thing was, quote, pure theater and the whole thing must have had a huge emotional effect on the jurors. Mm -hmm. Because at one point, they said something about how, like, Olivia's sister was called up onto, like, testify or something. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about a bracelet she had or a matching necklace she had with Olivia, and she started crying. But Mm -hmm. they had asked her questions in a way that would make her start crying. Sure. So that Watson would seem like this awful person for, like, taking this girl's sister. No, absolutely. Yeah. So in January of 2016, Mike White facilitated two meetings between Scott Watson and Gerald Hope in Rolleston Prison. Each meeting only lasted about three hours. So during their meetings, they discussed the concerns each had over the investigation and the trial with Hope saying, quote, we never got the truth. We haven't got the truth yet. If a victim's parent is saying, no, this isn't the guy. Right. Or willing to be meeting with him. Right. To be like, can we talk about this case that I feel was incredibly unfair? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Hope also said that he confronted Watson over the pressing questions he had about his circumstances on January 1st. So like where he was on January Mm -hmm. 1st. Hope said that after he asked, Watson went silent and that any answers that he gave after sounded unconvincing. Hmm. However, Mike White was there Mm -hmm. and he said, quote, I don't think there was anything that Scott Watson evaded or didn't want to answer. He was very open. So I guess Hope's kind of coming into it with like different views. Well, and you got to wonder if the guy feels slightly uncomfortable because... Allegedly, he is responsible for the death of his daughter. Right. 
So Mike White went on to add that Hope had doubts about the case for a long time and that Hope rejects crucial evidence that led to Watson's conviction. Okay. So all around, we don't really know what's going on. Yeah. So naturally, we have some appeals. The first student lead anywhere. He tried. They didn't go through. But we have something interesting that came up in June of 2020. Oh. So in 2020, it was reported that Watson's case would be referred back to the Court of Appeals because of continuing concern about the reliability of their forensic testing used to show the two hairs found on the blanket belonging to Olivia. Mm-hmm. Obviously, because we had a lot of, yes, you know. In May of 2022, the court agreed that when this hearing goes forward, Watson will be allowed to challenge if the eyewitness evidence related to the blank photo was properly obtained and should be heard by the jury at his trial. The week-long hearing will take place in June of 2024. Yes, yeah, so that's still, still ongoing. So then, back in 2010, I know this is kind of all over the place, but yeah. these are just little things that were happening. So in 2010, Scott's father, Chris Watson, teamed up with journalist Keith Hunter to make a complaint to the Independent Police Conduct Authority, Mm -hmm. the IPCA, about the police conduct in the case. Mm -hmm. In their complaint, they said that the main inspector of the case, Rob Pope, ignored relevant evidence, spread rumors about Scott Watson and his family, swore false affidavits to obtain search warrants, and that the police bought or pressured two prisoners into telling lies in court that they deliberately or accidentally contaminated the hair samples found in Watson's boat. So majority of all the things we went over, which are all the ports where we were like, that doesn't doesn't sound right. Obviously, this kind of report jabbed at and was being super critical of the work that Deputy Commissioner Rob Pope did. Mm -hmm. Duh. The report went on to say that the photograph montages that the police had used breached so many rules that it exposed the integrity of the investigation to justifiable criticism and to the drawing of interferences about intention and motivation. The report also said that police failed to pursue all of the leads that came in to find the, quote, mystery catch that it, that was seen by many, many witnesses. Some witnesses even believed they saw a woman who could be Olivia Hope on board of this mystery catch. Yeah. Meaning she was never on Watson's boat. Yeah. But those leads were never followed up on. So people even and they said. they found the bodies, right? Mm-mm. So people even said, I saw a woman on that mystery boat, yeah. and I think that woman could be Olivia. And the police were like, meh, thanks for letting us know, like never following right. up on it. But as of August 13th, 2010, it was found that police did fall short in some areas of the investigation into the murders of Hope and Smart, that their mistakes did not have a significant bearing on the inquiry's outcome. But Keith Hunter and Chris Watson weren't okay with this answer, and they made their complaints known and heard, so the IPCA launched an inquiry into investigation to him. (laughs) The IPCA found that the operation did fall short in three respects. They found that there were errors on the affidavits used to obtain search warrants and that they fell short of the high standard of accuracy needed for a warrant in the first place. Yeah. But they rejected that Mr. Pope, the investigator, had intended to mislead and found the errors did not strike the heart of the document. So pretty much they're saying that while there was an error, they know there was an error, they saw that there was an error. They're trying to say that Mr. Pope did not know that the document was inaccurate when he signed it. So his mistake did not constitute misconduct or neglect of duty. So he didn't know there was an error. So by him signing it, he thought he was signing like a legit error-free document. Uh Uh-huh. But it's like, you're a police investigator, police commissioner, like high up dude. You didn't see there was an error? They also Mm -hmm. found that it was highly undesirable for a member of the investigation team to give a suspect profile of Scott Watson to the community. And that it was highly undesirable how they made the photo montages and used that to show witnesses. So they're pretty much saying... Yeah, by him telling the stuff about Scott and giving out his criminal history and talking about his family, that's highly undesirable. Right. It's also highly undesirable that they did this photo montage with the blink photo and that they showed that as, like, evidence. Yeah. But that's all they're saying. It's just highly undesirable. (sighs) Justice Lowell Goddard, lead of the IPCA, said that it was a difficult inquiry and some action... No, it's not. (laughs) It is so fucking obvious. It is extremely apparent. All of it is corrupt and fucked. It is not even, like, a question mark. It is so obvious. I know. (sighs) So, Goddard said, quote, Some actions of police fell short of best practice and had the potential to influence witnesses. But in the end, Goddard said that where Operation TAM fell short had no significant bearing on the outcome of of the investigation. I can't stand stupid people. I know. That's why this case has been such a big, the most controversial case in New Zealand. It's it's almost like, this is like one of those situations where sometimes, you know, when you're aggravated that a child has tried to lie to you, you might come back with, I don't know if I should be more insulted by the fact that you (laughs) lied or you thought that I would believe that lie. Right. And that's, if I was the people of New Zealand and that's what I would be given, I would feel so insulted that you thought I was that stupid to believe that. Mm -hmm. Like, so in June of 2015, Watson attended parole for the first time. 
Since then, he has appeared before the parole board four times, and each time his parole has been declined. So during one of the denials in 2016, the board pretty much said that they would not release him until he has had psychological treatment to address his risk of reoffending. So his risk is always <clears throat> is already assessed to be really high due to it being a murder conviction. Mm -hmm. But as of 2016, Watson still denies committing the murders. Sure. So he has refused to engage with corrections department psychologists. So his risk of reoffending has yet to be treated, meaning that if he's not able to be re like in. He can't be reviewed, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So because he can't re be reviewed, his risk can't be reviewed. And if his risk can't be reviewed, he's always going to be considered high risk. And if he's always considered high risk, he will never be released. So it's kind of a really fucked up circle. But it's almost like, I feel like if you go to the Then you're kind of admitting that you yeah. did it. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Which yeah. is why he hasn't gone, because he's like, I didn't do it. Right. And he's held that since 1998. Right. So it's been, what, 25 years now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his next hearing was scheduled for October 2023, so it just happened. But mm -hmm. I couldn't find any articles talking about anything. Like, when you type in his name, it doesn't say, like, released or anything. So I assume that he has not been released. There was nothing I could find about it, but no articles popped up saying yeah. he was released, so I assume it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So in March of 2021, Guy Wallace was found dead. <gasps> <laughs> suspected suicide why okay so this suicide or his death was just days before he was scheduled to stand trial for four counts of indecent assault on a girl under 16 oh <laughs> <laughs> so like he seemed like such a good guy before you know what you know what you know what you know what wait when you first told me about this wallace character i said i said is his the only witness we got that says he dropped them off at that boat no, because we have the other people who are on board. Oh. Sarah and the other guy, they were a couple. They also, I didn't talk much about them because, like I said, this is a one-on-one -on -one class. But they also confirmed, like, we saw the catch that they were dropped off at. We saw them get off the boat. We saw them go on with this, mis like, this mystery. All right, man. I like, take it back then. We saw everything. But so you think <laughs> Wallace is, like, this great guy. And then I saw he was, like, you know, suspected suicide. I was like, oh, my God. Just days before he was scheduled to stand trial. Oh, my God. And then it was for these counts of, like, indecent assault. I was like, oh, dude. It's like, come on, man. I thought it was, like, because he was going to be pulled on trial for this case. And yeah. I was like, oh, my God, like, shit's going down. No, he's no. just now an awful guy. He's just a shitty person. So this is one of the few trials where someone received a murder conviction without a body being found. And the two bodies have never been found. This is, it's like, uh, again, I'm almost insulted that they really think that we would just be like, yeah, okay, checks out. Right. So it's technically solved. Mm. But like one of the cases you had, I have my doubts. Where it's oh my gosh, solved, kind of it like is. that, but like a little, but slightly opposite. You'll see. You'll okay, see. you'll see. You'll see. So I think the cops royally fucked up. Uh -huh. A lot of the stuff in this case doesn't. It doesn't make sense. It's just not. It's mapping. like they're, they're really trying to push the fact that two plus two equals five. Like, and they're not letting up. No yes. matter. You can show the manipulatives with four little squares. Right. Two and two, four, mm -hmm. not five. And <laughs> nope, it's five. Yeah, so I feel like they re really pigeonholed themselves into only looking at Watson and refused to look at anyone else. Oh, like I sure. said, and they had all they this just stuff. made it up. Right. Many people feel like this case didn't meet the threshold of beyond a reasonable doubt. Which There's so much doubt. Right. There's a ton of doubt in this one. <laughs> like, I feel like, not saying that the U.S. is better, but I'm saying if it had happened in the U.S., I think things would have gone a lot differently because of all the circumstantial evidence that they had. I feel like juries here would be like, mm, I don't feel comfortable saying that he 100% did it, even though we have had a lot and of fucked up cases here. But yeah, because I wonder, like, I just wonder how their court systems work because it is different from ours, but it sounds well, like s sort of and similar. If, if the entire island is under this influence of this media, right? So then you're not ready. Yeah. They're going in based on what they've heard. And like you said, it was only one sided. Right. And so they probably already have an idea in their mind. And so when the prosecution is presenting this case, it's 
what is that? Confirmation bias? Right. And so it's just confirming what they already went They're into like, oh, I heard the media say that. Yeah, yeah, this is like, right. you know, going on that. This and is corroborating my you, stuff. You just, well, they're just saying that because they don't want to get caught. Right. Yep. So apparently a local prevailing theory from when the case for, first broke was that drug smuggling boats were moored in the same area and that Smart and Hope were somehow caught up with individuals who then sailed into the Pacific. One self-proclaimed investigative group even went on to claim that they have photo evidence of Olivia alone on board a drug smuggling ship just days before she was reported missing. But again, that's just kind of like the local circulating theory. But either way, I feel like the families of Hope and Smart never really got the answers they deserve no. and may never know the full truth of what actually happened. So like I said, this was just scratching the surface of this case. There are so I can't believe many. this is considered just scratching. There are, <laughs> I know, there are so many documentaries, books, YouTube series, interviews, podcasts, TV shows, like everything yeah. literally about this case. And if you want to go down a rabbit hole, which I almost did until you were coming over in 30 <laughs> minutes and I had to stop, it's very easy to happen. <laughs> so there's literally no way I would have been able to include everything in this episode. But yeah, I hope I did a good enough job that, to kind I of mean, tell you what went on. I feel like I was given all the information satisfactorily to make an opinion yes that's how i feel too yeah i feel and like this was a great introduction 101 class thank you and there's really so much i didn't go into like the more interviews of the two other people who were on the boat yeah. when they were driven back and like just so many other people so who stuff. i couldn't touch on yeah because then this would be like a four-part episode and we don't do that correct so but yeah i just feel and he i think I, again, wasn't able to look into it, but I think part of his case is being looked into by the Innocence Project. Okay. And what they do is they... I guess they can be international, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they look into cases of people and they're like, this one definitely, like, something's going on here. But yeah, so this is the wild That's murder crazy. disappearance of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. It's not quite as confusing as I anticipated. Okay, good. Because when I first read this and I was doing my notes and I was like, okay, I got this. And then I read the one where it was really controversial. I looked at Joe. I said, do you think I can do this in today and Wednesday? And he goes, yeah, yeah, you got this. I said, cool. So he's watching the football game. I'm doing my research. And then I get like, you know, halfway into it. And I was like, Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but I was like, I'm already too far into it that I can't turn yeah, back now. Committed. So you're just going to keep going. No, I think you did a great job. I was I was not confused this time around. Oh, good. Um, Because people's, I mean, yes, people's names were similar. Don't get me wrong. Very similar. But it really wasn't like the other one where it was like, <laughs> <laughs> really, they all were the same person. Same person. Just like, one letter difference. That was confusing. <laughs> but yeah, so I think we're on the same page as everyone else where... I can't say he's 100% innocent, but I also can't say he is 100% guilty. Uh, there is reasonable doubt. Very much reasonable doubt. There's yep. 100% reasonable doubt. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, damn, girl. I know. Good one. Thank you. Very intriguing. Very intriguing. So, yeah, if you want to find out more, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> there is more out there. Love it. Love it. <sighs> All right, Mackenzie, what have you got for New Year's crimes? Okay, so mine is technically unsolved. But pretty much everyone who investigated, reported about it, is confident they know who is responsible. So like your other one. Which one? Rhonda. Yes, but more so. Oh. Because there was actually someone who went to trial for it. Oh. The Egans were known for their life of crime long before they were murdered it, on New Year's Eve 1964. In fact, many believe that their criminal lifestyle is what led to their untimely demise. Okay. So 1964 wasn't a bad year, despite the escalating Vietnam conflict and people mm. still mourning over the assassination of JFK. Kennedy's goal of space travel had advanced in January when the unmanned Apollo craft attained Earth's orbit. The Beatles were taking America by storm with three appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show. Wow. The Ford Mustang was introduced. Martin Luther King Jr. won the Nobel Peace Prize. The St. Louis Cardinals won the World Series against the New York Yankees. Nikita Khrushchev fell from power in the Soviet Union, and LBJ won his own term after having inherited the Kennedy presidency. What a year. Defeating Republican Barry Goldwater. So, Peter Egan Jr. was born May 15th, 1937, and his brother Gerald on July 22nd, 1945 in Watertown, New York. The Egan boys were not set up for success from the start. Both of their parents, Peter Sr. and Leona, were known as the town drunks. Oh. They stayed out late and spent most of their income on alcohol. It's not hard to believe that Peter Jr. and Gerald grew up to be troublemakers themselves. 
Peter had his first arrest at age 13 for stealing a car, and that was only the beginning. 13? Uh-huh. Stealing a car? Uh-huh. Gerald followed his older brother around and soon picked up all the tricks. Gerald was more sociable than Peter, and he's remembered as being the class clown. I'm sorry, which one's older? <clears throat> Peter. Okay. In 1956, Peter decided to head out west and was there for about eight months before deciding to hitch- hitchhike back to Watertown. On February 17th, 1957, the car he was riding in went off the road and crashed. Oh, no. Peter was ejected and suffered fractures in both legs, his shoulders, and his back. Oh, my God. He spent three weeks in the hospital in Humboldt, Nevada, before being transferred to Syracuse, New York, by train. By the time he reached Watertown's Mercy Hospital, gangrene had developed, and he was forced to amputate his left leg above the knee on March 11th, 1957. Jeez. Well, I mean, think about it. Usually, you're, like, (laughs) airlifted to a nearby hospital. They're like, oh, we're going to put you on a train across the country. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you're not going to feel great. mode of transportation. Jeez. So Peter was on crutches, but they wouldn't stump where his leg used to be. Oh. But this didn't hold him back. He was just as aggressive and fearless as he was before, and he never backed down from a fight. Peter and his brother were described as, quote, nothing but thieves. When somebody saw Gerald, they'd say, there goes that goddamn Egan gang. Jeez. <laughs> Some would even say that Gerald was a bigger thief than his older brother. But a local, Bud Davis, said, quote, he, al- he was always there with his crippled brother, and Peter could run faster with one leg than most people can with two. Gerald was Pete's legs. Peter would usually send Gerald in to do his dirty work while he sat in the car. Barbara Ann Vout was the complete opposite of the Egan brothers. She was popular in school, a well-liked cheerleader, and she had a promising future. She played saxophone in the school band and was a member of the library club. Oh. She worked a part-time job as a store clerk at W.T. Grant Department Store, and she was known as one of the prettiest girls in the county, and she had planned to settle down with her boyfriend, Gary Brown, after graduating high school. Despite there only being 27 members of her senior class. Oh, God. That's like just a classroom. I had 29 fifth graders for my, like, my math group. God. Like, I, there was more fifth graders in my one class one year than there were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jeez. But despite that, Barb stuck close to a tight circle of three girlfriends. One of her closest friends, Kay Hutchings Vargas, started to notice changes in her friend as they got close to graduation. She told Daniel Boyer and Dave Champagne, who wrote The Jefferson County Egan Murders, that Barbara started showing mischievous behavior. Mm. She began shoplifting and even made a habit of stealing other girls' boyfriends. Oh, God. They were usually younger boys, and she only did it for the conquest and to infuriate the younger girlfriend. And so I guess she's not with her boyfriend at this point? Mm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. As soon as she could prove that she could seduce a boy away from his girlfriend, she would dump them. Oh, my God. Her bad streak was only fueled when she met Peter Egan at a YMCA dance in Watertown. Peter was three years older than Barbara and the town's bad boy. Mm. Barbara broke things off with Gary, who was devastated by the breakup, and began spending all her time with Peter and his friends. He would even go with Barbara to her school dances. Do we know why she all of a sudden just started to have this bad streak? Well, so she is kind of portrayed as like, oh, she, you know, had this great future, but then she met this guy and... Yeah. But then people are also hinting, like, yeah, but she was also kind of, like, bad herself. Okay, because I get – because, like, where I thought you were going with it was she was this great girl until she met these guys. Right. But then you said they started, like, started doing all this bad stuff beforehand. Yeah. So that's why I was like, did something, like, happen beforehand? Like, why all of a sudden? she's – like, it was just, like, something that was kind of underlying Mm. her personality. Okay. Like, you know, something – Right. And it was – she didn't start shoplifting, I think, until senior year. The whole boyfriend thing – the girl Kay said that they've been doing it since they were freshmen in high school. Oh. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, she was just, she was nice, but there was just like, mm, you can kind of be a little mean. Okay. And also, we apologize for the rain noise outside. It's, it's been raining <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, so, if you hear any weird noises in the background, it's the rain. You just hear a gone says, shh, that's the rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One classmate said, quote, she totally changed after she got with Pete. It was like night and day. Nobody could believe it when she started dating Pete. He was terrible looking with no personality. <laughs> Pete was a horrible person, antisocial, and he looked dangerous. She goes on to say that Peter had, quote, a little man complex because he was so small and only had one leg. That's why he was always starting fights. <laughs> That's so funny. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I put it in there. Because Peter was only five feet, four inches. Just oh my <laughs> so, like, God. He was fucking short. Not much taller than me. <laughs> right, which it's like she's supposed to be this prettiest girl in school. Right. And here's this like short ass guy with one fucking <laughs> leg. And it's like, oh. They're awful. So we can, we can laugh. Right. And I get like, ooh, the bad boy. The bad boy, yeah. You know, like I understand that. But like, 
it was like her little bit of bad Mm -hmm. then just became big bad right big bad like she probably could have like if she was with the like a good guy good friend she could have been good if she had stayed with jerry bad company you know she Mm -hmm. would have been all right but now that she goes to pete right she ain't all right so Kay would cover for her friend and would lie to Barbara's parents that Barbara's with her when she was really with Peter. Kay believed that if she didn't lie for her, she would have found a way to sneak to Pete regardless. Okay. Eventually, Barbara's parents did find out, but that surely did not stop Barbara from seeing Pete. Barb knew it was wrong, but that's what made her sneak out to see him in the first place. Right. <laughs> Kay reminisced about how Barb would use her when she needed to borrow a car. Oh. And when Kay had to go out of town for her grandmother's funeral, Barb had, quote, borrowed her steady boyfriend. <gasps> Oh, my God. Yeah. Kay told Boyer and Champagne, quote, I'm not sure what I could have done to save her from her tragic ending. As the 1958 school year was coming to a close, Barbara was no longer associating with her friends. She spent most of her time with Peter's gang, and despite her parents' protests, the two were married in July 1958. In 1959, Pete and Barbara had their first son together, followed by the second in 1961, and the youngest about a year later. Oh, my God. One of the girls in Barbara's friends group made attempts to keep in touch after high school. She was absolutely shocked when she saw the state of Barb's apartment. Mm-hmm. Barb had always been clean and tidy type of person growing up. But right. now Barbara's home was utterly filthy Ugh. to the point that the friend didn't want to sit on any of the furniture. Oh, my God. I had that once when I was babysitting. <laughs> like, there's a difference between messy and dirty. Correct. Like, our house can get messy. Correct. But our house isn't dirty. Correct. And so their house was dirty. Ugh. And there was one point I was like, I wouldn't want to sit on any of the furniture. And so I would just like sit on the very edge of the furniture. And like, I never wanted to touch anything. Like it was just, (sighs) ugh. They had a lot of cats. So I used that as my excuse for when they later were like, because one of the kids tried to throw a blanket over me. And I was like, oh my God, like, please don't. Like it has cat hair. I'm very, very allergic. They're like, oh, we had no idea. And I was like, no, it's okay. Like you didn't know. So then the mom was like, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were allergic. I was like, yeah, like I'm very allergic. Yeah. They had like seven cats. Ew. And so at one point, I never wanted to babysit the demon children again. (laughs) And so she asked once, and she was like, oh, can you babysit? And I was like, no, like, I'm so allergic to the cats. Yeah. So, like, I was allergic, but it was just, like, the perfect excuse. Oh, yeah. So after, like, three times of her asking me, being like, nope, cats, sorry. (laughs) They never asked again. Thank God. We're a little. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, they have seven cats, so, like. The kids who made me, like, be like, you know what, I'm I'm ready to get a full-time job. I never. I think I remember again. you telling me about these guys. Oh, yeah. Ugh, Can't do God. it. Stars won't allow it. I think one of the times I was literally talking on the phone with you when the kids had locked themselves in their room. I think so, yes. Mm-hmm. I think you're correct. Yep. <laughs> I do recall that. Yep. So Barbara's appearance had deteriorated as well. The friend said, quote, she was no longer cute, but instead looked roughed and hardened. She, side note, she isn't named in the book, so... um. Who, the friend? Yeah, so it's not Kay, but it's somebody else. Okay. Uh, but she goes on to say, quote, I was appalled to see Barb living in such despair with three young boys having having to live in squalor. I knew that word was going to come out. <laughs> I was just waiting for squalor. <laughs> <laughs> While Kay never visited her old friend, she did hear that the Egans had a monkey living with them. A monkey? Uh-huh. Saying... Quote, like a dog and had the run of the house and was mean and pooped all over. That's like this house they babysat at. They had a chicken. <laughs> Dude, what? Who? How did you get in touch with these fucking families? Mom was like, I have a friend who needs a babysitter. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had chicken and then there were baby chicks upstairs in the bathtub. Yes. Um, their dog was an indoor outdoor dog. They had the many billion cats. So they had seven cats, a dog and a chicken. And, and like 12 chicks. Oh my God. Uh huh. Like, do you want to <coughs> see all the ASPCA? They're like, do you want to see our chickens? I was like, I'm sorry, what? And they're like, yeah, the chicks we have in the house. I said, okay. So we go upstairs. Sure enough, in the bathtub, there are chickens. And I'm like, what the fuck? Where am I? There was a family who lived in the basement. I don't know. Lauren! <laughs> what the fuck? I know. <laughs> Awful. Awful sounds horrendous okay so yeah monkey free reign of the house (laughs) because the egans never paid rent they were often evicted from their home and had to move around a lot a classmate of barbara's remembered a time when barb and the kids went to her classmate's mother-in-law asking to rent a cabin at sackett's harbor the mother-in-law said that it appeared barbara was under the influence of some kind of substance and was in desperate need of a shower 
Two of her sons were with her at the time, and they were wearing only the dir- their dirty diapers and were completely filthy. And how old were they? Well, young enough to wear diapers. Well, yeah, but I'm wondering, like, are they, like, five years old and in dirty diapers? Are they, no, like, I think three? They're younger. Okay. Based on the timeline of everything and when the kids were born, they're still really young. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is still, like, 1961 to... Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. This all happens in a very short amount of time. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Needless to say, her request was denied. So Peter was in chronic pain due to his leg, and he was a hab- habitual drug user. Mm. He shared his painkillers with his wife, and mm. over time, the couple began using other narcotics as well. As the drug use increased, their, beca- their behavior became more erratic. Local businesses had banned the Egan kids from their stores. Oh, my gosh. They realized that Barb was using the kids to distract them while she shoplifted. And at one point, Barbara was detained for stealing one right shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because Peter only needed one. The confused store manager was unaware of her husband's handicap. <laughs> that is so bad. I, I know. I know. <laughs> but I mean, you don't need the left one. You don't. You just need one. You just need one. Can I get these for half price? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord. Um. In April of 1962, Barbara and Peter were involved in a high-speed chase with police when they're, when the pair narrowly missed hitting two police officers. Oh, my God. About seven miles into the chase, the officers could see that the male driver and the, his female companion had switched places. That's impressive. I thought so, too. Especially with one leg. <laughs> right. The car eventually crashed into a utility pole, but no injuries were reported. The police found 21-year-old Barbara in the driver's seat and her 24-year-old husband, Peter, on the passenger side. Pete has had a suspended license, so the couple often did this Mm -hmm. if needed so that Peter wouldn't be charged with driving with a suspended license. Right. And which foot did he lose? Okay, so left. Left. So right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he can still drive. Right. (laughs) Police also found a plethora of merchandise. Things like spark plugs, wallets, and trousers were found in the truck on the car. The couple was arrested on reckless driving charges, and additionally, Peter was cited for driving without a license, and Barb was charged with permitting the unlicensed operation of her car. When Barb was 22, she had been charged with forgery. She had pleaded guilty to reduce her charge and was sentenced to probation. So, married, 1958. This is 1962, so four years. Jeez. This has all occurred. God. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara told Kay's mother, uh, Anna Mae Hutchings, that she felt trapped in her marriage. Kay recalled, quote, My mom would tell me Barbara would, st- would stop in to see her. She told my mom she feared for her life and was unable to break away from Pete. Barb felt close to my mom, so she would confess her true feelings and fears to her. Barbara's brother, Stephen Vout, conveyed in a brief telephone interview, quote, she just got caught up in it and she couldn't get out. Regarding Peter Egan, Vout remarked, quote, he was crazy, he was no good, and his brother wasn't much better. One source I found reported that Peter would keep Barb high or drunk most of the time and was regularly abusive to her. Jeez. Peter, of course, also had his fair share of charges and jail time. He would typically spend a few weeks behind bars for anything from drunk driving to assault. Barb would stand outside his usual cell and talk to him from the street, shouting through the fence. (laughs) At one point, Barb returned to sex work with Peter as her pimp. He would set her up with Johns, and if he deemed the situation okay, he'd give her the green light. Peter's police record grew to 13 arrests, and he became under suspicion of being the leader of a burglary ring. When I was first typing this, I almost said ringleader of a burglary (laughs) ring, but then I realized I can't do that. (laughs) That's more fun, though. Oh, I have one that, a little fun little rhyme coming up later. Of course you do. (laughs) In the days preceding the New Year's Eve of 1964, residents and establishments in Watertown experienced an unprecedented wave of burglaries. The once tight-knit community where everyone knows everyone suddenly lost its sense of security, compelling people to lock their doors for the first time. Oh, wow. Speculation circulated that Peter and Gerald Egan were behind the criminal activities, yet law enforcement lacked sufficient evidence to formally charge them. A bunch of misfit individuals were suspected of being part of the burglary ring. All of them were criminals and typically did the jobs together. James Pickett was always up to something, constantly on the lookout for a good opportunity. He had a family, and his friendly personality made people comfortable around him. He didn't seem like your average crook. Willard Belcher, a 49-year-old who occasionally worked as a truck driver, discovered that robbing was a more profitable venture. In his younger days, he spent time in the boxing ring under the name Kid Kelly. Willard's wife, Bertha... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who was 20 years his senior, Ooh. was a powerful presence. Sounds but, like it. Mm-hmm. You know what I... <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know if this is appropriate to keep in, but 
when I first read it, I immediately thought of the movie Norbert. Oh. <laughs> Big presents. Yes. Oh, yeah. Powerful. <laughs> the couple tied the knot in October. Who, Bertha and her 20-year younger person? Yeah, Willard. So the couple tied the knot in October 1948, and by all standards, they were an unusual pair. Bertha had previous brushes with the law, including suspicion of bootlegging and running a disorderly house, which <laughs> was a term used for operating a brothel. Yup. In Watertown, Bertha ran her own cleaning business, and she would use her job to scope out the best houses to rob. She would tie, tip off the crew about the locations of valuables inside her client's house. Following her instructions, they would break in, execute a quick burglary, and split the loot among themselves. Occasionally, they would bring in young teenagers for extra help and paying them in cash. During her visits with Anna Mae, Barbara learned when the Hutchings would be heading to Florida for extended vacations. During these times, their home would be burglarized more than once, and police, of course, suspected that it was the Egan's. Jeez. Then there was Joe Leon, a childhood friend of Peter Egan. Growing up just a couple houses apart on Duffy Street, Joe was the complete opposite of Awkward Pete. Popular and thriving on his family's reputation, Joe's dad, Anthony, was a boxing champion known as Kid Sullivan. Everyone in Watertown knew the Leones, and all the kids wanted to be friends with Joe. Smooth and clean cut, Joe Leone could charm his way out of any situation. Working as a truck driver for Wonder Bread, he was known for giving kids free donuts and treats. Yum. At 39, Joe was a divorcee living in a townhouse with his girlfriend, Beth Johnson, seemingly leading a quiet life. However, this outwardly polite and refined gentleman was not as he appeared. Joe Leon played a significant role in the burglary ring. <laughs> Too many R's. <laughs> alongside Pete and Gerald Egan. So the Egans were receiving welfare benefits, which seemed to be their only visible income. They did make some good money with their burglar jobs, but Pete spent it as quickly as they made it. Mm -hmm. Pete would buy rounds of drinks at the bars and constantly loan money to friends. Barbara supposedly complained about her husband's frivolous spending and said if he had all the money that he had loaned out to people, he would have like four or $5,000. Oh my gosh. for then would have been a lot of money. For now, that's a lot of money. Right. Well, despite this extra income, they still didn't pay rent. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hey, I mean, if you've been going so far without paying rent, why start now? Hey, right. Pete's desperation for money was sending him into a tailspin. He even robbed the house of Joe Leone's parents on Duffy Street, a brazen act of disrespect. He stole more than $700 in cash, as well as Joe's mother's diamond ring, which was a treasured family heirloom. Wow. The Leones had known him since he was a kid, living right down the road, making this burglary particularly shocking. Joe's father, aware of the Egan boy's involvement, was furious. He met with Joe, urging him to straighten out his friends. Joe spread the word among their close associates about Pete's poor judgment and vowed to address the situation before the year ended. Meanwhile, Pete and Gerald faced scrutiny not only within their circle of bandits, but also from the FBI. Oh. Gerald had traded an old Jeep for a stolen 62 Chevy convertible, making it a federal crime as the stolen car crossed state lines. Gerald took the car to a local farmer for repairs, but the farmer, sensing something was sus, it's the word of the day. Sus. <laughs> Sus. Alerted the authorities, leading the FBI to surveillance the Egans. So after Christmas in 1964, Pete and Gerald faced an uneasy atmosphere at their regular hangout at Red Moon Diner on Lower Court Street. In addition to the Leon burglary, they stole $1,000 from another associate, Joseph Gonski, who issued a serious threat against Pete. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Amid rumors of a hit on Pete's life. <laughs> <laughs> One more sentence. I think we could have figured out what the threat was. <laughs> uh, amid, he became increasingly anxious. <laughs> on December 31st, Pete spent most of the day at Red Boon Diner, moved around to various locations, visibly nervous. At Windmill Cafe Bar, he expressed the need for a shotgun, revealing the burglary that weighed on his conscience. Oh, jeez. But he was unsuccessful. Despite failed attempts to secure a firearm, Pete was given a proposal from his friend, James Pickett, at Rotary Gas Station. Pickett suggested a job for the night, hijacking a truck carrying $16,000 worth of liquor to Canada. Jeez. Pete was to assist and earn $1,000 quickly, potentially resolving the threat against him. Gerald, playing pinball at, a, at the gas station, was reluctant to join due to a prior engagement. However, Pete insisted on his little brother's participation, and the plan was to return to Watertown before midnight, with Pete inviting others to join a New Year's party at Watertown Bowl. He even invited Joe Leon and James Pickett to join with them at the Water Bowl party after all this. Mm -hmm. But Leon said he wasn't interested in going since he never really enjoyed New Year's Eve celebrations, and Pickett was expected home since his mother-in-law was in town. 
<laughs> Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go out. My mother's coming. <laughs> you have to be here. Around 7 p.m., they left Red Moon Diner driving northbound on Interstate 81. Oh, 81. Good was, old 81. It was just just starting to be built. Oh. It was a, a baby 81. Baby 81. Yeah. Oh, the hours I've spent on that road. <laughs> Barbara, Pete's wife, tagged along, still preparing for a night out with curlers in her hair. <laughs> they dropped the kids off at friends' houses to stay the night so they could party big. Mm-hmm. Barb even took the family dog, a Pekingese named Queenie, along for the ride. Oh. They made a stop at Green's Gas on Broadley Street to purchase supplies before heading out of town. They bought beers, Coke, Coca-Cola. <laughs> 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 Seamless. I was gonna know what you meant. <laughs> well, given the time, I'm like, okay, it might be believable that they could go to a gas station. Keep going, <laughs> so last minute, put the cola in there. there <laughs> oh, cola. <laughs> yeah. And work gloves for the two boys. The three Egans headed to the predetermined rest stop to meet with Pickett and Leon to help hijack the liquor truck. But the truck never came. Bill and Beverly J. were traveling to Norwood, New York to be with family and friends on New Year's. They had already been traveling for about three hours and decided to stop at a rest stop a few miles north of Watertown. They pulled into the rest area around 9.20 p.m. and parked behind a blue 1955 Mercury station wagon. Okay, so this sentence is going to sound weird, but I don't care. Bill left the car running and Beverly in the car while he tended to nature's call. Makes sense. No, I know, but it's like (laughs) car running and it just sounds weird. Okay. It sounds very smooth. Um, As Bill started to make his way over to a slightly snow-covered grassy area, he noticed something in the snow on the passenger side of the vehicle. As Bill approached the car, he saw a lifeless body of a woman (gasps) lying face down in the grass. Oh, no. Bill started to reach down to see if she was all right when he noticed a large pool of blood around the woman's head. Shocked by what he found, he went around to the driver's side of the station wagon. The windows were fogged over, so he wasn't able to tell who or what was inside. Mm -hmm. Bill opened the door and saw two motionless men seated upright. The door opening caused the two figures to tilt <gasps> to the right. Oh, well, that was my left. <laughs> <laughs> that was my right. <laughs> yeah, okay. See? Yeah. Um, there was also a small dog, its fur matted with blood with, from the upper back of the front seat, barking and excitedly oh. jumping around. Oh, okay, at least the dog's okay. <laughs> Bill immediately closed the door and ran back to his car to tell his wife what he had discovered. He sped off with the hopes of... <laughs> this isn't funny. I'm just thinking of a part coming up and how it's going to be funny. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh he sped off with the hopes of finding a telephone to contact authorities would not be easy on new year's eve they didn't see any public phones as they drove around and local businesses were closed early for the holiday the jays grew increasingly frustrated as minutes turned into what seemed like hours shirley coleman was at her home with her five children all between the ages of two and eleven <sighs> god bless <laughs> On New Year's Eve, 1964, Mr. Coleman had stepped out to get supplies from a nearby store for their expected guests. Stepped out. No, no, no. <laughs> Legit. <laughs> I thought the same thing when I first read it, but he comes back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go get some supplies. No, no, no. no. It's true. He, he does. He, <laughs> and he comes back. Okay. It's all good. <laughs> um. When there was a knock at the door, but instead of the Coleman's guest, Shirley found two well-dressed strangers who were very distraught and asked if they could use the phone to call police. Normally, Shirley was very careful about who she allowed into her house. However, the couple didn't seem suspicious or dangerous, so Shirley showed them where the phone was. As Bill J. made the call, Beverly J. sat in the living room with the Coleman children. Beverly was so upset about what they saw at the rest stop that she clung to one of the younger Coleman girls for 45 minutes when she came to sit on her lap. Eventually, Joseph Coleman arrived home and tried to help his wife calm down, calm the Jays down. Before they left, Bill told the Colemans what they had seen at the rest stop, a brutal triple murder. Mm -hmm. The Jays left the Colemans' home to head to police headquarters, and from there they showed police where the crime scene was. State Trooper C. David Hudson was the first to arrive, followed by Troopers Ronald Ferguson, no, Roland Ferguson, and B.E. Buddy Boyer. What a name. <laughs> wow. <laughs> when the troopers confirmed to headquarters that they were at a major crime scene, they called in Lieutenant Thomas Nulty, the Watertown Zone State Command, State Police Commander. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, the lieutenant was hosting a small gathering to ring in the new year. When the call came, the entire party completely dispersed. As more calls were made to various sheriffs, detectives, and troopers, New Year's Eve parties across the area were ending abruptly. 
The investigators found the woman wearing Kelly Green stretch pants with a darker green imitation suede coat and only a single snow boot. Her hair was in curlers and initial examination showed at least one bullet to the head. When they went to open the door, they found the small Pekingese crouched on top of the front seat's backrest. Her paws were resting on the shoulder of one of the slumped over victims. The dog didn't want to be removed from its owner and had to be distracted in order for investigators to carry on investigating. What? Investigators to carry on investigating. That was really good. You're really clever. Thanks. (laughs) Uh, The men were in darker winter jackets, sports shirts, and trousers. The victim in the passenger seat was leaning across a wooden leg strapped to the stump of his left thigh. The victims were well known to authorities, and it didn't take them long to identify 24-year-old Barbara Egan, her husband, 27-year-old Peter Egan Jr., and his brother, 19-year-old Gerald Egan. 19? 19. Jeez. The Coleman's never saw the Jays again, but would later hear a news report about the identities of the victims. They recognized one of the names, Barbara Egan, who was the daughter of Raymond Vout, who was a colleague of Mr. Coleman at Northrop Motors. The news of the murders made headlines that night, and the Egan's mother, Leona, was in a bar when she heard the news about her sons. Hmm. People who were there say they will never forget the cries of a mother losing her son. Oh. Sons. 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 Multiple. Plural. (laughs) Yeah. This, the crime scene was oddly silent, and it took place on the relatively new I-81, still under construction in some areas. On New Year's Eve, when festivities were in full swing, few cars had taken that route. No discernible footprints or tire marks were visible in the snow, and there were no fingerprints at the scene. The killers seemed to vanish without a trace. The fogged-up windows suggested that the occupants had been alive recently. In- mm, mm-hmm. Inside the vehicle, Peter and Gerald were found in the front seat, both shot in the head. Bullet trajectories and holes in the windshield supported the theory of a targeted attack. Mm. Two 25 caliber bullet casings were discovered behind the front seats. Gerald had been shot in the left temple and neck, and Peter received two shots in his ear. Oh. Uh, Barbara's body was found outside, shot in the head. Signs indicated she had attempted to escape, but was overpowered and dragged back to the car by her hair. Oh. Barbara's autopsy revealed bruising and signs of a struggle, suggesting that she fought her attacker. Unfortunately, she had no chances against bullets, and the killer killers had employed two different weapons, a 25 caliber pistol for the brothers and a 38 for Barbara. Nine, okay. nine shots were fired, with six hitting the victims. Jeez. The crime scene indicated a brutal execution, reminiscent of gangland-style killings. What's interesting, too, is the dog wasn't hit. Yeah. Yeah. The investigation revealed the Egan brothers had stopped at Green's Gas before the incident, buying two pairs of gloves. Only one pair was found in the car, leading police to believe finding the missing gloves would lead to the killer. Why are you laughing? (laughs) The Egan's dog, Queenie, could have been a potential witness, but sadly she was adopted by the brother's aunt and later met an unfortunate end. She got hit by a car. (laughs) Mackenzie! (laughs) I know. Here I am. Oh, thank God she didn't get hit by the bullets. And that's when you started laughing. I was like, what happened? So you can well imagine that I was like, oh, I was I was reading this story is sitting in my grandparents' living room. So like there's family members around and I'm reading it and I'm like, oh, thank God. My, my dad was like, what? I was like, the dog doesn't die. So it's good. It's fine. Reading a couple sentences later, I'm like, oh, they're like, what? Is everything okay? I was like, the dog died. That's so sad. Yeah. The Egan children were taken to a rehabilitation facility due to neglect and their whereabouts remained. I know. Their whereabouts remained unknown after being moved out of state for protection. And we have no idea. Like, that's it. That's all we know about them. Oh, wow. A joint funeral was held emphasizing the brutality of the killings despite the victim's shady reputation. Speculation arose that the triple murder was linked to the victim's involvement in illegal activities such as gambling or drugs. Mm -hmm. An unnamed witness implicated the Egan's in numerous burglaries, shedding light on their criminal activities. Although the murders remained unsolved, the spike in burglaries in Watertown ceased after the killings, revealing the Egan brothers as the culprits behind the city's crime wave. The Watertown Times reported the end of the burglary wave following the Egan's murders, and witnesses came forward attributing many burglaries to the Egan's. The police, though, yet to solve the murders, were successful in solving other crimes. So this is a quote from the Watertown Times. One beneficial result of the Egan murders is the abrupt end to numerous burglaries which have been a thorn in the side of authorities for months. The Egans were the manspring of the burglary wave, and they had become expert in carrying out their program successfully until they came up against the wrong person or persons, suspected by the authorities of being identified with small-time rackets. Ah. 
The information obtained from a young informant also uncovered a planned liquor truck hi- hijacking with James Pickett. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with James Pickett allegedly putting the Egan brothers onto it. Pickett, facing legal consequences, eventually cooperated eh, and revealed Joe Leon as the possible orchestrator of the ambush, claiming Leon had threatened Pete Egan earlier for stealing from his family. Additionally, Leon felt that the brothers knew too much about him and would possibly expose him. Pickett said Leon believed that he had to get rid of them for good. Pickett found it odd that when he informed Leon about the murders on January 1st, that Leon appeared genuinely surprised, as if it was news to him. Mm -hmm. Despite the widespread knowledge of the incident in Watertown, Leon claimed ignorance, stating that he and his girlfriend Beth spent New Year's at home without watching the news. However, in the following days, Leon allegedly confessed to Pickett and implicated Willard Belcher as his accomplice. Mm -hmm. Although the story was compelling, the police needed more evidence to charge Leon. By May of 1965, five months after the murders, Leon, along with Willard and Bertha Belcher and police informer James Pickett, became prime suspects. Suspects. During police questioning, Leon denied involvement but showed signs of deception during a polygraph test. However, suspicion alone was insufficient for charges. Mm -hmm. To build a case, police placed a bug in the Belcher home but discovered explicit phone conversations rather than evidence related to the murders. (laughs) (laughs) It took three years for enough evidence to emerge for the arrest of Joe Leon in connection with the Egan murders. Three years. Mm-hmm. Damn. During the interrogation, Leon remained completely composed. He, he was even balancing a nickel to demonstrate his calm demeanor. Oh, my God. Bertha Belcher, age 71, was arrested alongside Leon with Pickett claiming that Bertha orchestrated the killings. Willard Belcher faced murder charges but was declared criminally insane preventing his trial. Ooh. He was already in jail for something else and then... Got charged for this, and then all of a sudden he had some insanity role. They don't go into what happened, why he was considered insane, but that was it for him. He got the insanity ruling and was like, okay, well. Dang. Yeah. So despite facing serious charges, Bertha resumed her cleaning business after release and even helped Leona, the Egan brother's mother, when she faced legal trouble. Leona's bail was set to 75000 which she could not pay, leading to two years in county jail before his trial in January 1970. During the trial, District Attorney Bill McCluskey faced the challenge of presenting a primarily circumstantial case. Yes, circumstantial cases. Mm -hmm. Pickett's testimony played a crucial role describing how Leon orchestrated the murders. The prosecution portrayed Leon as the lone killer using two handguns never recovered. Despite changing his story 40 years later, Pickett testified against Leon in court. He claimed, Joe Leon and Willard Belcher drove out on 81 that night in Joe's girlfriend's car. They parked behind the Egan's bakery, and Joe got in the back seat. Willard Belcher was tasked with removing Barbara from the car and managed to do so. They walked a short distance away when Barbara heard gunshots and headed back to the car where she found her husband and brother-in-law had been killed. She tried to run towards the highway. Leon fired three shots from the car and missed. Then he got out of the car, cut up with her, overpowering her, and she was shot and her body was dragged closer to the car out of sight from passing motorists. Prosecutor McCluskey his opening statement said, quote, the killers ran Barbara off, but she returned. She knew death was coming and she tried to run. Leon chased her, caught her, and she was thrown to the ground. Barbara Egan put her arms around Leon's knee and begged for her life. That's when Leon shot her in the head. Later on, before his death, James Pickett would claim that Barb was told to actually drive Beth's car for about 10 minutes or so, and then she returned to find her husband and brother-in-law murdered. Mm-hmm. So that was the big change. Right. Leon pleaded not guilty, and his defense sought to suppress polygraph evidence, questioning the lack of fingerprints inside Eakin's car during winter. Mm-hmm. Leon's girlfriend, Beth Johnson, supported his alibi, claiming that he had been home by 7 p.m. on New Year's Eve, although she had previously told police that when Leon came home that night, there were spots on his jacket. Mm. After an acquittal on April 5th, 1970, Leon walked free. Rumors circulated about threats to jurors, but no evidence was found. They claimed a man in a foreign accent called the home of four jurors and allegedly said, quote, if Joe Leon is found guilty, you are dead. Oh. So the case remained closed and the files are sealed with the belief that Leon was guilty based on street justice. Mm-hmm. Despite extensive searches for murder weapons, they were never recovered. And Pickett suggested the weapons might be hidden at the gang's hangout, the Rotary Gas Station, which at this point I believe is no longer there. Yeah, I doubt it. Leon chose to leave the case behind, moving to Tennessee, then Kentucky, and eventually settling in South Carolina. Joe Leon has passed away, and this case will never officially see a conviction. Yep. However, some sources claim that Leon, Leon did confess to the killings later on. Oh, like, I would love a deathbed confession. Right? 
Authors Daniel Boyer and Dave Champagne, touring North Country for their book, offer a unique perspective on Watertown's crime of the century. During their book tour, a particular story stands out. Daniel Borer, who was in first grade when he first heard about the murders, shares a personal connection. For over a year, he eagerly awaited the local Wonder Bread truck driver each week, who generously gave him free donuts. <laughs> one day, the familiar driver stopped coming, and a new one took over. Curious, Daniel asked about the previous driver and learned that he had been arrested for the Egan murders. The driver's name was Joe Leone. Oh my gosh! And that is the Jefferson County Egan murders. Dang! So... Not solved, but everyone's but, like, this yeah. guy did it. But solved. But solved. Yeah. Yeah. I hate those cases. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's, you know, everyone knows who did it for both of ours, but mine right. never got con- The right person <laughs> probably was on trial. Right. <laughs> and didn't get convicted. Jeez. Yeah. Well, because, so like, for Bertha's arrest, she now it changed to like accomplice. Oh. Because if... Because of her husband's like insanity plea, so like his oh interesting part, like doesn't count. That's really interesting. So it kind of like in a way clears her. Yeah, and so what that also meant was that they couldn't use any of the recorded conversations, mm-hmm. which mm. it didn't sound like there was really much of anything. But they couldn't use it anyway, and they did get the polygraphs suppressed. Right. So like the results of that couldn't be talked about. And also, that's never like it's not admissible in court, anyways. Right. Exactly. So. This is kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, well, we all know he did it. Right. So, but it was just also interesting that the life of crime that they led before. Yeah. In such a short amount of time, too. Yeah. This literally happened in the span of six years. And when you were like, you know, at the one point when they were getting chased by the cops and you're like, oh, yeah, she was 21. Mm-hmm. You're 21, ma'am. Yep. You have three children. Yes. You're 21 and you have lived a hardened criminal life already. Yes. Jeez. Absolutely. So interesting. Yeah. Not good people. Not good people. By not good people. I feel the worst for the dog. <laughs> I also feel the worst for the dog and the children. And the children, yes. Yeah. I hope because there's really nothing else on the kids. So I just hope that they probably, you know, names were changed, pushed out. Well, and they would have been really little. Really little. And so hopefully they don't have a lot of memory of things. Right. Maybe the oldest one might have some. The squalor. Yeah. And hopefully they're okay. Wow. But yeah, the dog was really shocking. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank God, the dog's alive. Like, as soon as I saw that she was bringing the dog, I was like, oh, my God. If she, if the dog dies, I, can, I don't think I can do this story. Right. Dog doesn't die. I said, oh, great. I can still do this story. Everything's fine. A couple sentences later, well, they can't use it because the dog got hit by a car. I know. <laughs> I was like, the fuck? <laughs> That's a little piece of information I didn't need to know. In one of the, in the, the book that is published i could i could get access to like the first 100 pages or so on google because i was not gonna i didn't want to buy it no yeah absolutely not (laughs) um and they have pictures and they have a picture of the dog and then a cute dog yeah it's what kind of dog was that again a pekingese so it's like a small little fluffy dog oh but like the caption underneath the picture is like uh Queenie before she was hit by a car. <laughs> like, or something, like, just so... Oh, my like, God! I have to find it. It's, like, it's so aggressive. Oh. Oh, not this one. And sorry for the bleep, everyone. I had to plug my computer in. <laughs> oh, I didn't even... I didn't even hear it. Oh, okay, yeah. Queenie, the only survivor in the Egan triple homicide, was struck and killed by a car two weeks later. <laughs> oh, my God! That's the dog. Can you... Oh. But, like, that caption is just so aggressive. <laughs> <It really is. laughs> like, oh, okay. And you know they probably had to add that because so many people were like, how's the dog doing? Right. How is the dog? Well, because they said that, like, the investigators thought, well, if we find the person, we can bring the dog around. And if it freaks out, then, you know, that is some sort of cooperation right. or whatever. Cooperation. Cooperation. <laughs> um, but they couldn't because she was oh hit by a car. God. Yeah. That's truly tragic. Guns don't kill people. Cars, Cars do. Kill. <laughs> oh, well, nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. We hope everyone had a good holiday, however you yes. chose to celebrate it. We hope you have a good New Year's, however you choose to celebrate it. Yes. Safe and wonderful New Year's. Yep. And and we're bringing holidays. in happiness and joy and health and everything good into the new year. Yeah. And hold on tight, my fellow sad friends. 
the time is is getting longer. We have passed. We've the, passed the shortest day of the year. Yep. Time is literally only going up from here. Yep. Daylight is increasing. Yep. As soon as these fucking clouds go away. Yeah. Stupid goddamn rain. It has been awful lately. It just makes the sad sadder. <laughs> <laughs> We hope this is a little bit of light. Yeah. So, yeah, like us, review us, all those things. People mm-hmm. keep giving us five stars on Spotify, but no one's letting us know that you're doing that. You got to let us know. So let us know if you are the ones who have been rating us five stars on Spotify. Just a quick email to mm-hmm. a scary state podcast at gmail.com or mm-hmm. any of our social medias. We'll get in contact with you and we'll send you a little something. Have people reached out to you and you ignored it? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I just had this memory pop into my head that I think my cousin's girlfriend was telling me that like one of the places we've talked about or like there is a place, I can't remember if we've talked about it before, but she's gone there because she lived in that area. Oh, and cool. I said, that's great. You should send us your story to a scary state podcast at gmail.com. And I forgot about that memory until you said that. <laughs> So yeah, to all of you, send us your story. We know so many of you are like, I have a story. Send it to us. We love to hear it. And then we would love to hear it again in written form. Yes. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Like tell us twice. And then we can do a listener's episode with your stories. I've never done one, guys. We have, we're just getting there. We just need a couple more stories and we'll be golden. I wish, nope, I'm not even going to finish that fucking sentence. (laughs) That you had a story? Nope. No, 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 no. Yeah, we'll not even go there. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So I guess on that bomb, she'll stay scary. (laughs) Stay really safe. (laughs)